questions from lecture 10? So just saying that uh, well, we're gonna end RG pretty quickly. Uh, I cut down on, water down the exact RG discussion in the interest of getting to nano billing stuff faster. So uh, today we're gonna do that. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, if there are any questions at any point, please stop me. So today we're gonna to start as usual with a review of the previous lecture, lecture 10, in particular nonlinear sigma model. I'll comment on nonlinear sigma model in higher dimensions, because we did zero and one, um, no, so we did zero plus one and one plus one. So uh, talking about nonlinear sigma model in higher dimensions, uh, we will talk about exact RG very, very briefly. Unless you guys have questions, then I'm happy to elaborate more. And then we're going to start. So if you recall, this whole story of nonlinear sigma models uh, was an attempt to construct interacting quantum field theories, right? That was the goal of this story. So um, we tried uh, we tried lambda five four in four dimensions. It was pointless. Um, that we talked about. Um, uh, ON, right? And ON did not uh, help us. And for the nonlinear sigma model, as this trick we played where we uh, we, we changed the role of what is space time and what's the internal manifold, that helped. But then we still didn't have a four dimensional interacting QFT. So, and we'll, today we're going to start this new section, which is gauge theory. So we can go back and look at non-abelian gauge theory. So we also said that QED is bad, is not asymptotically safe. So uh, QED um, had Landau pool. So that was pretty disastrous. What other theories do we know? Well, we argued in part one of the course that in the infrared gauge theories come up, right? Lattice models in the infrared gauge theories appear naturally and in particular, non-abelian gauge theories appear. So QED is the abelian one, the simplest thing possible, U1. What if we consider non-abelian gauge theories? Are we going to end up with honest to goodness interacting QFDs in D equal four based on the principle of gauge redundancies? And the answer is going to be yes. So that's going to be QCD and a success story. That's why QFD is still a thing. Well, one of the many reasons. All right. Good, so that's the plan. So let's start. I just said this, but let's review this again. So in our search for interacting QFTs, we consider lambda phi four theory, because that's what everybody does. In D larger equal to four, we saw there are no interacting theories. In D equal three, at large N, we showed that we found an interacting uh, IR fixed point. This was a Wilson Fisher fixed point. We argued for this large N because we wanted to stay within the perturbation theory. But of course, there could be fixed points and there might there are fixed points, but they're just not accessible through perturbation theory if your N is not large. In D equal one and two, there are all sorts of interacting theories, particularly D equal two, let's talk about. And, but our, the question is, are they relevant for fundamental physics? All right, so nonlinear sigma model. Now, linear sigma model was this trick where we, in our conventional interpretation of quantum field theory, the fields were considered a map from some uh, some sort of, from the space time manifold M to uh, an internal field manifold. So it was if it's a scalar field, this X. If it's a real scalar field, what is X? I can't hear a single word. All right. R, if it's a real scalar field, if this is R, if you ever hear a compact scalar field, that is S1, right? That's when you identify the R by like, so it's a phase. And you could take it to be, uh, we in ON model, we considered it uh, to be an N-dimensional space, right? So RN, right? And we could take it to be, uh, as we, we do in, the uh, nonlinear sigma model you can take it to be sphere S n minus one, right? But in linear 
not a billion, oops, non-linear sigma model, and non-linear sigma model, the, the main, well, the, the physics is the same, but the interpretation uh, step as the key thing is we interpret the target space, the internal field manifold as a space time. And we call this M that used to be space time, if it's zero plus one world line, if it's one plus one world sheet, if it's larger than two world volume theory. Right, and we write down expressions that are local in M, of course, as you may recall. So this target space could have a manifold, uh, could could have a metric. We call that a target space metric, and so on and so forth. The simplest example we considered was zero plus one d sigma model, and we saw that this is a relativistic particle. So how does this work? The field is a map from R, right, zero plus one to x, this r is just time, and the field is phi of t is x mu of t, right? We're gonna interpret x as the location of the particle and this uh, in some ambient space time, which could be r d comma one, right? Or d minus one comma one in the notation of this, this part two of the course. Now, um, you have these Schrodinger states, which is x mu t at time t, you have a field particular field configuration. This is a particle, uh, the location of the particle at time t. Then what we did was we derived, uh, we did the same set of steps that we, we usually do to derive the path integral expression for uh, the overlap of these vectors in the Hilbert space. And we quickly realized that there are two sets of fields. One of them is x mu of s which is the position of the particle as a function of s. And then the other one is e of s, which is some local time reparametrization, right? So the variable that parameterizes r is t, right? And how you map t to the position x mu of s, what is the, like how fast along this parameter are you evolving, right? So this is, if you if you recall, we discretize this and this e of s was some sort of parameter, uh, uh, reparameterization function. So these are our fields, but we saw that this field is non-dynamical. It's a constraint. So when we derive the, uh, the path integral expression for this overlap, we found that there is a path integral over both fields, right? So X mu and E of S. And the action that we derived was the world line classical action is this. So it's an integral over D of S Ada mu nu x dot mu x dot nu e minus one of s and then minus half e s m squared. So if you vary this, so what we said is that if you vary this to find the equations of motion for e of s, you find what exactly? What is what are the equations of motion for this? All right, I trust you guys can derive this. You plug it back in. In the saddle point approximation for E of S, you could plug it back in inside the action. You well, first once you plug it in, you you learn it's a constraint; it's non-dynamical. You plug it back in, and you learn that this is this path integral uh, in the saddle point approximation, right? In the saddle point approximation, you replace the path integral with this uh, saddle value. Uh, once you plug it in, it becomes uh, integral of I M integral uh, of square root. A to mu nu x dot mu x dot mu. This is the target space metric, right? And what is this? The proper length of the curve. So we what we recover is a first quantized relativistic free particle as a zero plus one dimensional sigma model. Good. Any questions about this part? All right, then we talked about, oh. then we talked about nonlinear sigma model and d equal two. And in particular, we called it nonlinear sigma model because we took X to be S n minus one. That is, or well, the, the nonlinearity, the origin of nonlinearity is this condition. So if you want to think of it, this is for example, R two, Right, that is our uh, world sheet theory. If you want to view it, it could be 
two dimensional QFT. It is a two dimensional QFT. And the field takes value on Sn minus one, n minus one sphere, right? So the field is this n, these n i's, they have to add up to the, the score. The norm of this vector has to be one, right? Like let's say unit norm. So one of the very first things that you learn in this is that this expression is only sensible if n as a field is dimension less, right? Otherwise, you have to introduce a dimension parameter or some scale for this, right? That you probably do not want to. All right, so that's one thing. And that will actually decide the, uh, why is that important actually? So let's say in this expression, phi is dimension less, right? Then what is the dimension out? What is the dimension of the coupling, which in this case is a target space metric? Dimension less. So it's a marginal deformation. So there's a good chance, naively marginal, there's a good chance the theory makes sense uh, for arbitrary metrics. Yeah. Well, just A W nu or like delta i j or right, some trivial. So and introducing introducing curvature as like a, Marginal deformation, naively marginal. You have to do the proper quantum uh, thing. Oh, by the way, just just in, in if you want to know what happens if you replace S n minus one with R d comma one, that theory has a name. It's called string theory, and your beta function, your your couplings are space time metric. Your beta functions, if you set them equal to zero. Now you know what it means to set beta functions equal to zero. The beta functions will be a fun it will be a function of the metric has to start metric has to start up an equation, right? That equation is not surprisingly Einstein's equations. So if people say string theory includes in it gravity, that's what it means, right? You just as a nonlinear sigma model, the space-time metric is a target space metric. You write down the beta function for it, you set it equal to zero because you want the theory to be fixed. Well, actually, I can, we can go on why you want it to be remain conformal. And the, the resulting constraint, the fixed point condition, will tell you that uh, turns into Einstein's equations of motion in the target space. So you derive the target space equations of motion this way. But anyway, that's a, that's a tangent. All right, so uh, this NI field, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like write it this way, pi one to pi n minus one. And this is some sort of operator equation that ensures this relation, right? So pi squared is pi i pi i, right? So with these variables, if I write down my action, I'm gonna get the following Lagrange that hopefully you recall this g is dimensional less, right? But that's a coupling I can just put in there. Um, so it's just, this is the standard canonical term. Now notice that now this vector has n minus one components, right? So O n minus one is linearly realized. What does that mean? It means that, oh, I erased it, but it means that if you look at the transformation, what you're doing is you're sending pi i to r i j pi j. This is the linear transformation. And O n minus one is this condition, right? This is the condition. So it's re realized linearly, right? Whereas the full symmetry of the theory we know is O n from the S n minus one picture, right? But the last bit is realized non-linearly. Yeah. G square. Uh, I thought the coupling is the G i j. So let's say G square. So let's say G square. Yeah. What do you mean by d squared? Well, for, first of all, here in Lagrangian density, I can just put this. Yeah. Right? And it's it's good to put that uh, because as we said that this Lagrange, well, okay, there, there are various ways to discuss this, but this sets an overall fact function sitting outside of the metric sense. 
right? It sets for you some sort of a, an overall scale. So it's not the same as the G at the at the GI No, it's a well. This GIJ is this. Okay. This is the GIJ, okay. right? So this Lagrangian density, this thing has the correct dimension. When I stick it inside the, in, I have to integrate over time. I can always divide it by some other coupling, yeah. or I can interpret that coupling as some some overall function that sits in my metric. It's really a question of like choice, okay. right? I, I just can't but that's a G, that's a G. So yeah, I, I shouldn't call the G in okay. other respect, yeah. yeah. Good, but what matters is that they're all dimensionless, right? And now we had this comment, well, in anticipation for this, um, the important thing is that you see that this is one, one minus pi squared in the denominator, right? That is different from the philosophy we've been following so far, right? The philosophy has been so far, you write down the Lagrangian in some derivative expansion and in some sort of expansion in the powers of phi and the derivatives. If you expand this guy, this has repackaged an infinite you know, like summation. But again, we're not terribly concerned with that because this is this is a marginal deformation, right? It's low dimension enough that things are things might be good. Now, but a good wor point of worry is that well, we saw that in in, in, in lambda phi four or uh, real scalar field. Every time you added a new term, right, you had a new coupling. So in normalized perturbation theory, you would worry about you need you would worry about like whether the, uh, you have enough counter terms to cancel the divergences. Here, the form is very, very specific, meaning that the, co the, the relative coefficient between these interactions is fixed by symmetry, imposed by, by symmetry, and everything is written in terms of a single coupling. But that single coupling, when you go through it, and we did go through it, is sufficient. That single counter term is sufficient to capture all the divergences. This is one advantage of symmetry. Right, it gives you non-linearly realized well, some some interaction terms, things that look like interactions. So, this is very, I, I guess this is an example of a bigger principle. The simplest form of interactions we could cook up that might stand a good chance of being healthy is some sort of constraint. Right. So this is just some lesson. All right, in perturbation theory, what we did was that we took this expression, expanded in powers of pi, right? This is the thing. We had an infinite number of interaction terms dictated by a symmetry. There's only one normalized coupling. We went through this. We wrote down the Kalin semantic for the endpoint functions of pi's, right? Of course, Kalin semantic is MDM beta G del G plus N gamma of G. Is, are there any questions about what the uh, these the Kalin-Semantic is? At this point, it should be very familiar. If it's not by problem set three, it will be very familiar for us. Um, so now this gamma of g uh, is g squared over four pi and minus one. The beta function. So th this tells you about what gamma of g. Yeah, it's about like how scaling, how, how, how the amplitude of the field of renormalizing, the wave function normalization, right? And um, beta of G is uh, the, the running of the coupling, right? So it comes out as minus G cube over four pi N minus two, right? Like this. So G, if G is positive as, and N is larger than two, this is negative. That is wonderful because it's asymptotically free. But notice the, all the non-trivialities that go into this, right? N minus two, things like that, right? So it's not that that theory might look, look totally safe based on dimensional counting, power counting, but there once you calculate beta functions, you gotta be careful. There's There are lots of subtleties. So this looks good. It's all uh, nice and clean. Any questions about this perturbation theory? Of course, this is yeah. This is uh, one loop perturbation theory, if you recall, right? There was the issue of, in derivation of this. There was the issue of the uh, a really hor horrible divergence, lambda squared divergence, that we said is 
canceled by the contact terms, right? The contact terms, the origin of contact terms. I did not summarize that again, but the origin of the contact terms was what was the origin of the contact term? The right, the constraint. The constraint in sticking the constraint in the path integral would log of that delta function. Well, if you expand that delta function as a, uh, you could write it as an integral, right? And pull it up in the action. Now there was a delta function coefficient, delta of zero, delta two of zero, right? Sitting as the coupling of this term. This is precisely the right term that will uh, cancel the offensive uh, lambda square divergence that you find in perturbations here at one loop. Do you remember what this was contributing to? What was this adding? Well, okay, I'm not gonna torture you here, right? Anyway, this was the calculation we did last time. Now, all right, so that uh, closes my review of the previous lecture. Any questions about that? Which bit? Sorry, where? Uh, the metric which you used. The metric I used. This? Yes. Yes, correct. Does it have any significance to it's geometry, right? We're 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 talking about the the sphere metric. Yes, but what I tried to say is that like, is this somewhat we are taking a projection of it by if it's or something? Well, in a sense, yes, you're projecting to, uh, okay. n n squared equal one unit norm vectors. So there's a. Maybe you're asking a different question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here, here, hopefully, it's clear what is meant by nonlinear sigma model, right? Nonlinearity of it has to do with the fact that we had a constraint, right? It's a sphere, for example, right? Of course, it could be fancier, but um, yeah. I forget whether we discussed it last class or not, but uh, are there any physical applications to the knowledge sigma model when the target space is SN also? Um, physical application, you mean? Like, yeah, three models of physical systems. And it's not like a yes. drawing model that will. Yes. So uh, nonlinear sigma models, I mean, any, yeah, nonlinear sigma model. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, it's uh there's a large class of there there's a, well I'll, I'll I'll tell you about it. there's a book uh well in critical you ask when we say when you ask about applications you're talking about in critical phenomena, right? You're talking about statistical field theory. There's a whole book on statistical field theory. It's called Zin Justin, and uh, it goes through a gazillion examples. Is yeah. This is by the way the ultimate field of reference, but it's like an encyclopedia. Yeah, it's an encyclopedia. Oh. All right. I don't know. I don't remember anything off the top of my head. It's probably kind of silly if I think a little bit. I can probably say something, but not at all. All right. Any other questions? So, so far, what are the theories that we found that make sense? As in Lambda 5 4 is Wilson Fisher. Right, where we saw we started with the Gaussian fixed point and three dimensions at large n, we flow with imperturbation theory to an entrapping fixed point. Right, so that's a sensible theory. There, at, when n is not large, there are all sorts of non perturbative stuff, but perturbation theory is not going to help us. Right, and uh, and then there are these nonlinear sigma models. Good, this is, this is pretty good, right? This asymptotical theory. But it's sensible. Now let's talk about nonlinear sigma model in larger than two dimensions. So let's just stick to SN minus one. First thing is what's the dimensionality of G, the coupling G now? Yeah, so the dimensionality of this is two minus D over two. Right? So it was good that we were working in dimension two because this was dimension less, right? 
But now, the uh, now that we are going to higher dimensions, it's going to be irrelevant, right? To start with, naively irrelevant. So it's naively dead. An arrival is dead. But as we're going to see, as you study it, there is a chance that it, you might still have uh, some interesting, sensible theory, right? So we'll see that in a second. This is the opposite of what we were doing before. If you recall in Lambda Phi 4, in higher than four, higher than four dimensions, it was irrelevant. In four, it was marginal, but in four exactly, it was dead. Below four was naively relevant, and we worked it, and it was okay. Here, what we, what we had a theory that at d equal two was marginal, it was sensible, as opposed to Lambda Phi 4, where the marginal case was dead, right? So we are emboldened by that, so we keep pushing. What if we can see it higher than two dimension two, right? So naively, it's uh, irrelevant. So let's just uh, take the dimensionality out of it. And let's expand it the same way that before we did it for minus epsilon. Now we're going to enter the world of like irrelevant deformations. Let's expand it in two plus epsilon dimensions, right? So I'm saving you the time of this cal the energy to, cal to this calculation, but it's not at all different from the calculation we've already discussed. We just put the dimensionality in every integral. You obtain the following thing. Epsilon over 2, h is your coupling, minus n minus 2 over 4 pi h cube, right? This has a very wilson fishery structure, right? But it's important. This is So there's a wilson fisher fixed point when these two terms cancel, right? And this is the expression 2 pi n minus 2 epsilon. You could talk about small dimensions, or you could enter the world of really irrelevant deformations if you keep large and large enough. So whether how how irrelevant? So this is something that is not visible from just power counting, naive power counting. But n actually decide plays a role in how relevant things are. Right. Th this is like one key. Uh, uh, statement. So you could take, for example, epsilon to be order one, like one working three dimensions, which naively looks like a horrible, horribly relevant deformation, but quantum mechanically large and safe might save you. Right? So there's a fixed point here within perturbation theory. But now this I claim that this this is very different from the Wilson Fisher that we saw before. How is it different? Can anyone see? What did it look like before? Uh, minus a power h term plus power h squared. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so this term is positive. This term is negative. They cancel out. Previously, the epsilon term, the dimensionality term was negative, and this term was positive. Do you guys have a guess as how that, that's important? Why is that important? I'm just going to tell you in the next slide, but... I guess for small h it is positive. So we don't have to. Yes. No, for small h is positive. Yes, correct. Yes. So what does that mean? It will flow. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, but it will flow away from the trivial fixed one h equal to zero and go towards the uh, frequency fixed one. You said the opposite. Yeah, but uh, well, let me. <laughs> Well, let me do make a comparison. So I'm going to make a comparison between the lambda five four Wilson Fisher and the nonlinear system model S n minus one and D two plus epsilon. All right. So first, this deformation chain four minus epsilon epsilon is positive. Okay. This is naively relevant, dimension counting relevant. This is dimension counting irrelevant. The beta function here is minus epsilon lambda plus n plus eight. Lambda squared over a pi. So this is negative. This is positive, and they you find a, a fixed point by the zero of this. This is epsilon h minus. So this is positive. This is negative, right? That's where the competition comes from. If you take a derivative of the beta function, right? Here you get minus epsilon plus da da da. Here you get epsilon minus something, right? So the derivative changes sign near the fixed point. What does the derivative decide? The direction of the flow, right? So 
if you plot beta of lambda as a function of lambda, right? In the lambda part four, it has this behavior because near near the Gaussian fixed point is negative. Here it has this behavior, right? This means that the flow is in the Wilson Fisher is from the trivial to Wilson Fisher fixed point, right? Whereas here you flow, so the Wilson Fisher is unstable. So this is a stable fixed point. This is an unstable fixed point. You flow towards a trivial thing. So what's the lesson for the what, what's the lesson? Do we end up with interacting QFTs or not? We end up with a fine-tuned interacting QFT, conformal invariant theory, right? But not the QFT, a CFT, right? The moment you deform that by a tiny bit, you're just gonna flow in the IR to Right. So yeah, there we don't have an interact, we don't naturally flow to an interacting point. They're unstable. They're unstable. They're this instability. Yeah. Can you put theory value here to meta stable fixed points? Meta stable. What is meta stable usually has a time parameter? So what is like like I'm saying uh, here is either a maximum or a minimum. So yeah, maybe so. Maybe I, I uh, yeah. The only the only thing I can think of is like let's say this is a some sort of you have to go to higher dimensions. Let's say this is a fixed point, right? If well, this is a fixed point like this, like this, uh, like this, right? So this is a stability analysis. Let's say if you have stuff, they come if they they come very close. I don't know how to say this, but they, they if you they come they come very close and then if you go. Yeah, it's more like a seven point. That's what important. Yeah, it's like a, it could be a thousand. Yeah. Um, in principle, all sorts of things can exist, right? All sorts of things can exist. You're solving a differential equation. Yeah, you're solving a, a differential equation, right? There could be all sorts of extrema. Um, but yeah, this is an oversimplified picture, right? In the case of ON model, it's actually a little bit nicer because. The symmetry gives you a principle for like all sorts of terms, right? The idea would be something like in lambda phi four, cutting off the action at phi four and not including phi six is ad hoc, it's unnatural. And the RG is gonna get created, right? There's no symmetry that forbids a phi four, phi six term. So it's odd to not include it. In the nonlinear sigma model, the nice thing about it is that there are symmetry principles, right? That tell you the good reasons to not want another term, right? That that's what it means to repackage all of this non-perturbative, right? So, yeah, I, I, if you recall, we said under RG, anything allowed by the symmetry is created, right? So the power of the symmetry is very manifest. Here, here it's important because in, in linear Sorry, linear will realize symmetries, they're not controlling the interactions, right? They're not, they cannot restrict, well, they are controlling the action by the very silly way, like uh, non-restricted way. And on theory, any, any expression of this type is allowed, right? By transpose part to a power of n is allowed. But in an, uh, in an, in the linear sigma model, this is not no longer allowed, right? This kind of stuff is not no longer allowed because there's a nonlinear. The fact that it's nonlinear it means that the symmetry controls interactions, right? That's why we make such a big deal out of it. So it is really in lambda five four. It's weird to write down lambda five four and not include a five six term, but here it's not. Good. So this closes the chapter on nonlinear sigma model, whatever we're gonna say in this course. If you wanna learn more about them, you take a string theory course. All right. So notice one thing is that the coupling of nonlinear sigma model is the metric. Right? So here, as you were observing, I 
pick this particular metric on the sphere and then there's a dimensional parameter that sits outside overall parameter and I'm just talking about the flow of that single number but in principle it's a flow of full metric so it's an equation that your beta functions will tell you about the flow of a metric if you're very math oriented there are names for such things right there's like Ricci flow there are those kind of things that appear in mathematical physics nonlinear sigma models all right, very good. Any questions? So the comparison is clear, hopefully. All right. Um, all right, so exact normalization group. This is gonna be the last very quick discussion of our uh, RG. And at first, uh, Oh, okay, well, let me not uh, rant. Um, the picture of RG that I presented, uh, I have presented up to this point, right, was integrating out Euclidean momenta, integrating Euclidean momentum shell. So what did we do? We took the path integral, went to the momentum space, why did we, why do, and then we truncated in momentum space. Why did we truncate the momentum space? Because the path in the road, because the action of free fields is an integral it, it basically momentum in, in free field theory, relativistic free fields, momentum modes are decoupled, right? So a path integral over phi p1 and phi p2 are two different integrals, right? I can write down this path integral as integral over d5 p1, d5 p2, d5 p3, right? That comes from the fact that the action of free fields where we're expanding, right, is just. Um, It's just this, right? DDP phi minus P P squared plus M squared by P. Right? The fact that you have you have a path integral here, you could view it as multiplying a lot of integrals. Right? All right, so that was the origin of it. Now, this is clearly very much built around the idea of free, relativistic free fields. If you are a condensed matter theorist, or if you are someone who works with, you know, like some sort of a system that might not have relativistic symmetry, you would like to still come up with a notion of a normalization group, right? That would be some sort of coarse graining. Some, another thing that is natural to do is some sort of coarse graining space, right? Take a bunch of, to replace the field with some, its average over a region. Do something like uh, the, the Kadanoff spin blocking, right? So there is such a thing as real space RG. Now, real space RG looks kind of ugly in, um, for relativistic theories, but it's very natural. Actually, so if you have a theory that's expanded around um, the... Um, so here, here we're expanding another relativistic Gaussian theory, right? So what is the vacuum of this theory? Let me write here so that the vacuum of this theory is the tensor product over all P of zero of P's, right? So what would be an analog? So the, here, we're, what we're doing is we're doing a normalization group in momentum space. What would be an analog of a state that would be naturally uh, natural to renormalize it in real space? It would be a state prime, which looks like this. Have you ever seen any, any vacuum like this? I don't have enough. And that's my here. <laughs> non relativistic free bosons. This is the vacuum we find. So 
What's important is that here, it's important that there, there's no entanglement across here. Right? So it's, if you do RG under this state, this is going to become like, yeah, okay, well, I'll over, over explain. Good. So ideally, what you would like to do is you would like to connect the two pictures. You would like to have a formalism, like as I'm going to explain, exact RG, which neither the, which in some regime becomes momentum space RG, in some regime becomes real space RG, and anything in between, right? Because the integrating momentum shell for like condensed matter theory uh, systems might be not the natural choice, right? So what do you do? Instead of, so what does, what did we do here? Here, what we did was we took the, uh, we, we cut off the momentum, the, this path integral in momentum space, right? That was a cutoff. Let's just, so which means that we discarded UV modes. You clear momentum larger than shopping. Let's, instead of discarding UV modes, let's just suppress them. So I'm going to do it in a relativistic case, but it won't be very different than any other thing set up. So how am I going to suppress it? Well, here's phi x del squared phi x, right? That's the action of free, of free fields up to boundary terms that I've discarded. I'm just going to multiply it by k minus 1 minus del squared m squared. And this k of s is a function that goes from 1, so it's like a smooth uh, step no. Well, it's not a step function either. So it starts at one, and smoothly goes to zero at high momenta, right? What it does is that it suppresses the high momenta. If I just pick this to be a sharp, sharp transition, that's literally going to be momentum space regulator. But I can pick it to be as smooth as I want, and I could even mimic the strut wall here. Good. So this is a natural choice for cutoff. And the cut this, this M is my cutoff now. But it just tells me about the scale where I'm transitioning. Good. All right. So here's my action now. Every momentum uh, uh, that contributes to the action in this way, when Ks goes to infinity, uh, sorry, Ks goes to zero at large S, which means that the contribution of high momentum modes is large. The action is large, which means that the contribution to path integral is zero or small. This suppresses the UV modes in the path integral by making the action large for those modes, right? That's why I put K minus one, right? I didn't want to write, put a function that blows up. Good. So at first, this might be a little bit of, you would think that, oh, this is not, what was this going to buy us? Turns out conceptually, it's, this is called exact origin. Conceptually, it buys us quite a lot. But so, very good. All right, so what is the RG equation? What are the calvin siemens equations? How do you do RG? Well, let's just introduce a bunch of sources. So here's my cutoff. I'm going to introduce a whole bunch of sources. This is my action in the presence of sources with the cutoff, right? Every propagator has this function. So every time I have a loop integral, right, all the UV modes run in the loops, but the heavier modes, the propagators, have a suppression, right? So the partition function in the, of the, with the presence of sources, I can normalize it this way. The renormalization group equation is the statement that this generating functional is independent of M. It's like as concise as our G equation could be. As you change M, so you, what is important is that previously we were doing our G in two steps, right? We're integrating the momentum, we're doing a wild transformation to put it back in. Here you could do the exact same thing. You can do the exact same thing, but I don't even have to worry about it. I just say this generating functional should be independent of that. Are there any questions? In the interest of time, I thought I'm just going to go through a very formal discussion of it and not give any examples. This is what I want to say about Archie. Exactly, Archie, yeah. Uh, 
this is the overall of three, three things here, right? Like this. You know, you started off with like the not necessarily, but have interaction terms. As a matter of fact, I just simplified the matter for interaction terms. So what you do is, well, just, I wrote it as a bunch of sources, right? But like add to this some interaction term as you wish. When you do, when you, when you do perturbation, the Feynman perturbation theory, right? You'll have to have, stick in propagator everywhere in every calculation. There will be Feynman diagrams, right? But now your propagator has changed. Right? What is the change in the propagator? Remember? So now this is there's a k minus one of q over capital M sitting here. Right? What was the propagator? It was the inverse of this. So the propagator is multiplied by k, which means that the propagator for the UV modes is tiny. Good. So that regulates your integrals nicely. And you could formulate calcium matter, all of that here. No problem. Any questions about this? The benefit of the close down and doing it that way, like your normalization, you said. Uh, the, 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 well, so like, uh, Momentum, uh, can't talk. Shell, that's what the word I'm looking for. Momentum, what's the advantage of it? Simplest, right? Here I have to prescribe a choice of K minus one, K, right? And actually, the very, very, very good point. Here, physics should be independent of my choice of K, right? So scheme dependence is very manifest. It's in the choice of one, one aspect that is very manifest. It's in the choice of K. In the other case, it's like making you, from the onset, you make your choice of scheme, right? And then you go ahead and push through. This, this is the more general version. Like the, the advantage of the, well, there are many advantages, but it also makes your life much harder if you were to do this like all the time. In practice, this is not um, the most useful way of doing calculations because it's very painful, but I like it because there are examples of the workout and we've been writing papers on this. All right. Um, so for example, if, if you want to know, when, when I learned the normalization group, there was a normalization group of Wilson that people taught. There was exact RG of Polchinski. This is exact RG of the Polchinski from the 80s. And then, uh, there was something that's called entanglement normalization. That was a big deal in quantum information, condensed matter, and there was no connection between the two. Turns out that entanglement normalization fits into exact RG if you look at it correctly. So there's only one RG. This is something that when I was a grad student, I would explain. There's only one RG. If you understand this RG properly, it includes everything. Those are different schemes, if you wish. Those are all different schemes. Now, some schemes are completely irrelevant to some problems, right? If you're dealing with relativistic theory, you should not be doing, well, real space RG is a little bit problematic because you have infinite entanglement. But anyway, so that's all I was going to say. This, this ends the chapter on the normalization group. If there are any questions, you should ask now about RG. What's the what sorry? What is the social I, I'm missing one word. What's the so this source? Uh relativity. That's, that's not clear, right? Like I've not explained it, but it's it's a relativistic thing, it's type three algebra, type three one algebra. Yeah, so it's a it's a long story. All right. So now let me try to make the transition to the next section a little bit more smooth. We saw that lambda phi four does not exist, does not give interacting QFTs in D equal four. We saw that ON did not help, but nonlinear sigma models give us some interesting interacting theories, all lower dimensional, right? Um, we saw that gauge redundancies can also arise in the IR in the 
continuum limit. So the natural question, so we use global symmetry. That was a method for constructing quantum field series, right? We did it, we realized that linearly and non-linearly. The other principle that was in our, in our, was in our arsenal from part one of uh, QFT1 was gauge redundancy. It's so just naturally appear and you could include them as a model building method, right? So the question is, can you construct interacting theories in D equal four using gauge redundancies? The answer is yes, but this is goes in the opposite direction of what we saw in QED. QED is a U1 gauge theory, and we saw QED as a non-ability gauge theory is not kosher, it's not good, it's not interacting. It doesn't make sense as a fundamental theory, right? It's an effective theory. There was a Landau pool. Beta functions were positive. Good, this time we got it right. All right. Um, so turns out the answer is yes. It's kind of surprising, but it was surprising enough that Nobel prizes were given. Now let's go back to Yang Mill. So I, if there are any questions, I was planning on go on reviewing the whole Yang Mill, but I thought like I've done that several times before. I'm not gonna do that again. If one step that's like a leap, you tell me, right? Recall the action for gauge theory. Every time we're talking about the gauge theory, we call representation theory story, right? Um, we have to pick a representation for our gauge group, right? I'm talking pure gauge theory for now, no matter for now, right? I'm gonna add matter at some point, maybe a couple of lectures down the road, maybe next lecture. There is a gauge group and a representation, right? So there's a Lie algebra there. T of A are the generators of the Lie algebra that are canonically normalized, hopefully you guys recall, right? So the Lie group is a group manifold. Lie algebra is a tangent space. And these were relations between the generators, the commutators, right? Good. All right. A couple of uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, just to like make sure that I remember this correctly. Yeah. Uh, the F mu mu at the A and the R are as, as, as standard numbers. That's it. Right? The constant, so to say. What, 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 what do you mean by that? DA are matrices. Yeah. These are just numbers, right? No. <laughs> no. Um, all right. Um, maybe I should review things. F mu nu is a curvature. Uh, uh, right? F mu nu is a curvature. Um, so there are Lie algebra valued. Um, I'll try to review stuff. The gauge field is Lie algebra value, right? Well, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick review of the time. By the way, just I just want to draw an analogy between uh, the nonlinear sigma model story I was saying and gauge theory, right? If you remember in the geometric picture of gauge theories, I told you that their gauge group is a manifold sitting at any point. That's some sort of internal degree of freedom, right? But now it's a redundancy. The physical thing is the connection, right? If you guys recall, which was the rule about how these vectors are related from one point to the next point. All right, hopefully that is good. All right, so I'm missing a an index here. Yeah, I think let me let me correct this. Yeah, I think in the structure I was following. So the gauge field is a Lie algebra value, right? And uh, F mu nu are could be viewed as matrices. Um so this is this was the curvature, right? Because it goes into curvature two directions. All right. Um, so the action, the uh, Yang Mills action was minus one over four T of R. T of R was the normalization of trace of T A T B, right? It's delta function, blah, blah, blah. Trace of R, F mu nu, F mu nu, right? Written in indices, 
Okay, so first thing, this includes interactions. That's the point I'm going to try to make. Not in if the theory is abelian, right? I'm talking self-interaction. In the case of QED, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually explain. Um, so we'll see that. Let me let me do it for the case of uh, non non billing case, and you'll see what happens in the uh, billing case. So let's expand this expression. This was del so. Uh, yeah. So this f mu nu was d mu a nu minus d nu a mu. Right? Okay. This d mu itself was del mu minus i g a mu. Right? Okay. So let's plug that in. This is the expansion that we're plugging in. This is two times. So I'm just picking this, uh, expanding this term for now. Is two times T of R a trace, right? Of del mu a nu of this kinetic looking term. I'm going to call this two comes from the fact that I have two combinations, right? Uh, that's just basic algebra. This is a quadratic term. There are two A insertions. But because of the covariantness of the derivative, there is an A cube term that has one derivative. So these are two derivative, two field inversions. It's the kin standard kinematic term. That was what we were dealing with in the case of QED, right? Here is A mu, A nu. There's one derivative, three insertions, right? And then there are four, four, four uh, insertion terms, right? So in Feynman diagram language, hopefully you can already actually write down the Feynman diagrams in your head. Right, something that has three A's is a vertex where three gluons, right? These guys are coming and meeting, right? And they meet at a point, but there's also a derivative, which means an extra power P, right? Because we draw these Feynman diagrams and if you draw the Feynman diagrams in momentum space, Right, there will be a delta function that imposes conservation of momentum, but there's an extra factor of p. We saw the we saw those ex explicitly in the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Right, we saw those derivative terms, and for the four vertex term, there, there's a four vertex, right? Four guys meeting at the point, and nothing higher. Right, so here we have a principle to truncate at four terms and nothing higher. The principle is again symmetry, not quite redundancies. Right, we're gonna refer to the quadratic term as the kinetic, and this is a cubic and quartic as interaction terms. Good. Any questions? Oh, by the way, another important thing is that because g comes with this factor of a, right? The quartic is order g. The quad cubic is order g. Quartic is order g squared. Right. So previously we were saying that if you recall, I was saying that in the nonlinear sigma model, the terms were all they had one over G outside, G squared outside, and they had fixed signs. Here, the way it's distributed is that the cubic term has an extra power of P and a G and G squared for the quartic. Right. The guide, as usual, the guide for us to build theories that are sensible is always symmetry, right? One way or another. Lambda phi four drops us in this insanely intractable world. It's just very hard to track anything, right? Because under RG, everything is generated and who knows? And we saw that hoping for just like fixed points popping up in the infrared, apart from Wilson Fisher's. Uh, so if you ever see a theorist talking about quantum field theory and then they start with large N or something, now you have a sense of why they're doing that because they want to write down sensible stuff. Right. Um, let's analyze the kinetic term. The point of this analysis is to remind you of gauge freedom, the arc C gauge, right? And uh, in the non-abelian case, I did this for QED, 
right, for U1 gauge theory. And if you recall, the issue was the following. In QED, a massless, so your, your degree of freedom, A mu, has, naively has four components. How many degrees of freedom are there? Two, right? They correspond to two polarization of light. How are two those degrees of freedom, how, how do you kill the, the other two? What, what's the origin of that? No, but like, what's your, let, let's go through them one by one. So the, the simplest way that to see that A0 is uh, unphysical was that it decouples. It decouples from the rest, right? And we solve for it. You literally integrate out the zero component of it. You plug it back in the action. That's what we did in part one, right? And then you're left with three components, right? There is non-dynamical. A0 is non-dynamical. Okay, that gets rid of one uh, thing. The second thing was gauge symmetry. Gauge dependence. We still saw that there was a no meaning to, so there are three degrees of freedom, A1, A2, A3, right? We saw there was no, if if you uh, if you said that get rid of A0, uh, now like you you have just space, right? And you're, you're propagating in space. We saw that there is no physics, physical degree of freedom associated to uh, the direction of propagation. Right now, formally, the, the best way we saw this was the in the from the well, in my, in my mind, derivation of the propagator. So, I'm just going to re remind you, but more the better than remind it, reminding, I'm just going to go through it in the non abelian case. So, here's the kinetic term, I'm just going to separate the kinetic term trace of r a mu a mu a mu. This is up to up to uh boundary terms, this is the action you're dealing with, right? A the mu del squared minus del. New del mu. Hopefully you remember this is del alpha del alpha, right? All right, very good. So let's put in, put back in the uh, the uh, Lie algebra indices. So that there is like T A that comes with this guy, T B that comes with this guy, A B. You bring it out. You take the traces. You, you know they're all sorted out. You're left with this expression, right? Now, previously, you had a mu was a field with four components. Now you have a mu of a, sorry, little b. This b is labeled by the Lie algebra. You remember the dimensionality of your Lie algebra, for example, if you're an SUN or something, right? So those are all the degrees of freedom that you naively have. By the way, in, the, in d dimensions, how many degrees of freedom do you have in QED? The one gauge theory. So in four, we said it's two. You repeat the same analysis, you have D minus two. It's always one component, which is because it's time is separate, it's charge, you integrate it out, it's all good. And the other component is just the direction of propagation, right? So you have D minus two polarization. Similar thing is gonna happen here. So, okay, so this is the kinetic term. This is, let's give this a name, the Maxwell operator, and then there's delta AB, right? What does this mean? It means that in your, when you draw, right here, when you draw Feynman diagrams, right, like this, propagator, you have to put A here, right, mu, B, mu, but it's proportional to delta AB, right? So I can just drop that. Good? All right. Now, this is a Maxwell operator. This is the thing that appeared in a Maxwell theory, right? Uh, forget about this part. This is the matrix in gauge series, of course. Now, what is the propagator? The pro in, in momentum space, this is just, uh, you have to solve this equation. I think I'm just gonna call these P's. I don't know why I switched to K. I apologize. This is the, 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 the your propagator, if you recall, is the, um, can't talk. What is this called? The equation. Yes, <laughs> the Green's function. <laughs> Thank you. So you're solving this equation, right? This is the most explicit way. This equation is the most explicit way of seeing that there is one degree of freedom that's not physical. How do you see that? If you were to solve for this, you would have to invert this operator. But this operator is not invertible. It has zeros. What is the zero of this operator? Can you just... K mu. K mu, exactly, done, 
There we go. The problem is that this operator is no inverse. K mu is an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. That instantly tells you that that's just, there's something sick about that degree of freedom, right? This is the issue of gauge invariance, right? We saw that. And one way to deal with this was that we projected, we put in by hand the projection to the directions perpendicular to K mu. Then we saw that that matrix is now invertible, that differential operator is now invertible and that was a propagator, right? But then there were a couple of choices. The, the, the downside of this is that you end up with a bunch of, that's like you make a choice of gauge, right? The downside of that is that sometimes when we do calculation, we would like to know what is gauge dependent and what's not gauge dependent? A method that we introduced was this arc C gauge, right? Which is like we added this term to the Lagrangian, right? And if you derive this for general C, this adds invertibility. Now the thing is invertible. Here is the operator that's invertible. You invert it, and this is what you get for general C. You do the calculation for general C as we did in the case of QED. Now, every time an expression depends on C explicitly, that's gauge dependent, giant. Well, it's not physical. We saw some of the divergent terms that came out had C dependence, right? That's an advantage of arc C gauge. Right? We're going to play the same game here as well. But there were names for this. C equals zero is Landau gauge, and C equal one is finally gauge. Right? I think I was going to start the video of Popov. Well, let me let me pause here and ask for a bunch of questions. If I think it's a can of worms. If I start talking about video, probably it goes on. But any questions, right? So so far, um, this part I'm just reminding you of RC gauge. The 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 story is as before. In the case of non-abelian thing, the only thing is now your your gauge field. In addition, let's say let's say your gauge group is in a joint representation. Right now, in that case, a mu is labeled well. Uh, whatever the representation it is, it doesn't matter. T of a are the generators of the Lie algebra, right? A mu is Lie algebra valued, so you have a vector in space that tells you about the Lorentz transformation, Lorentz representation, right? And the a and b index tell you about the group gauge theory representation, right? Separate the two. In your head, but you have both of the labels, right? Um, we're still gonna use arc C gauge because of this issue of invertibility. The important thing that I said today that wasn't I, I, we hadn't seen before is that in the non-abelian case, the principle of gauge symmetry gives you interactions, very very fixed interactions. In QED, there were no interactions to be found. The only thing we dealt with. If there were interactions in QED, what would they be? What would they lead to? Uh, so in, uh, no, but physically, what would happen if there were interactions in QED? How would the universe around you would look different? And, uh, photons would interact. Photons would self-interact. Why is that horrible? The universe would have looked dramatically different. There's a reason. Well, there, there will be a mass that's like terrible. That, that has, that's a very, very good question answer. Yeah, that will change a lot of things. But just one naive thing is that photons are perfect information carrier, right? A source radiates some, you know, like a source gets scattered off, scattered off something, right? Registers the, info, the information of that content, registers it, it just propagates and comes to my eyes and I see, right? Along the way, it doesn't self-interact. That's important. Right? We're surrounded by a lot of photons. Atoms will interact. So if, if photons propagate in a very atom-dense environment, then they will not carry information as well. Right? They will constantly self-interact with their medium and will lose their thing. But our universe is full of photons. If they self-interacted, the universe would look very, very different. All right. OK, so with that, maybe I can just summarize, and we'll, we'll sub and we'll, we'll do uh, quantization next time, right? So what did we say today? We uh, started, we, we, we went over the nonlinear sigma model, um, the same story as before, but what the new component is that I added this time was higher dimensional nonlinear sigma model. I said that above two dimensions, it seems like dead on the arrival, the proposal, right? It looks like 
dimension counting naive, dimension counting irrelevant. However, we saw that we found that in, uh, at large n, you could have a fixed point, but then there was a catch. The catch was that the fixed point was unstable, right? So the fixed point flows towards the Gaussian thing. We're not going to naturally end up with it. Yeah. Right? So nonlinear signal model in higher than two dimensions is not something to worry much about, at least at this level, right? Then in, we were getting desperate to find uh, interacting four-dimensional theories. So um, we started talking about gauge theories. QED was dead, right? QED was not interacting 4D. So we started looking at uh, non-abelian ga uh, non gauge theories. So Yang knows we started the discussion. The punchline is going to be that it's going to give us some interacting theories, including the theory of our universe, QCD, or Sanomal, right? But the... Our, I, I just want, I'll try to do a more detailed discussion of uh, non abelian gauge theory, just a reminder from last time, because this is a switch, quick switch. But um, yeah, I, I think, I think I, I'm not gonna repeat myself. Next time, what we're gonna go over is we're gonna quantize non abelian gauge theory at the level of the path integral. So here's very important. Previously, quantization of QED at the level of the path integral was somewhat trivial. If you recall, the only thing we worried about, because the thing is Gaussian, right? The only thing we needed to worry about was gauge degrees of freedom. That's the only, that was the end of the discussion. There was no renormalization, pure QED, pure uh, photons, right? There are no interactions. We started doing renormalization when it included matter, right? But here there's a renormalization to be discussed for pure uh, gluons, for, for pure uh, Yang Mills. Right, because it's self-interacting. Good. We're gonna do proper quantization. There's a method. The method. There are several ways of dealing with this. Uh, the most common one that's used in perturbation theory in Sanomal is Fedia Popov. Uh, it's, we're gonna discuss that, but I want to also point out the BRC symmetry. There is a way more fundamental. Well, I'm also way more fundamental. Whatever it is I like, it's more fundamental by definition. But there's a more fundamental, way, in my opinion, way of thinking about it, which is based on BRC symmetry. If you want to know where it comes from, the origins of this is in the fact that every time you have gauge symmetry, you are dealing with constraints and non-dynamical degrees of freedom. There is a discussion of this in Weinberg, volume one. There's also a discussion of BRC symmetry in volume two of Weinberg, which is like very clean. I'll try to do my best in like doing a quick discussion of BRC. It's pretty advanced for QF2, but I'll try to include that. Uh, because if you know BRC supersymmetry, like cake, it's very obvious. Um, BRC is like an important symmetry formulation, like the, the, the form algorithm. Very good. All right, yeah, and I think uh, we're gonna discuss a little bit about uh QCD. We're gonna discuss um and eventually, we're going to come back to the calculation of beta functions of QCD and show that it makes sense, right? Um, we're going to talk about anomalies as well in the next part. Any questions? Last questions. Yeah. Uh, so you said you said that uh, it makes sense. Does it make sense only in QCD or what about other dimensions? Right? Uh, it, it makes sense in what? So does uh, QCD make sense? Does it only make sense in these equal to four or does it make sense in other dimensions? Also? Ah, you're asking what's the status of Yang Mills in different dimensions. All right, very good. What's the dimension of, okay, here it is. Well, <laughs> let's do an exercise. Uh, well, you, you think about that, but to, to think about, first of all, what's the dimensionality of the coupling of uh, Yang Mills in 4D? Zero. It's marginal, right? So what happens if we go to higher dimensions? It becomes irrelevant, right? So let's start lower our expectations. Okay, let's start with marginal. If we don't, if we succeed, we're going to go to our dimension, unless uh, stick with marginal. 
The, another question you could ask is what's the status of this in lower dimensions? That's another very interesting topic. But yeah. Yeah, it becomes relevant. So what's what what, what kind of theories you get? Here we're we're obsessed with equal four for obvious reasons, right? That's why we're going down this path. We're gonna end up on model part. If you have different opinions about whether we should or should not end on standard model, just send a message on Slack. I'm more leaning towards standard model over non-perturbative methods, but you guys. All right, any other questions?